Good afternoon. I'm Juanita Tautungi. Today we're putting the upcoming Nunavut territorial election in focus. Nunavut will be heading to the polls on Monday. It's the fifth, fifth general election since the territory was created. Now, 22 ridings are being represented in the Nunavut Legislative Assembly and right now 71 candidates out of the 72 are on the last leg of their campaigning, hoping to win a seat in this consensus-style government. One member, as I mentioned, is acclaimed, and that is in the riding and community of Kurluktok in western Nunavut. Now, we want you to join in on our conversation. Our phone lines are open. You can call us toll-free at one 877 647-2786. You can also tweet us at APTN in focus. Use the hashtag NUVotesInFocus. Before I introduce you to our guests, here's what some people in Iqaluit had to say about what is on their minds this election year. What are the biggest things facing Nunavut today? What are the big issues in your mind? Employment, housing, health care, and all sorts of other things that we daily face. Mm, there's many issues to be talked about, but the main ones, I guess, that we look forward to hearing is on house shortage and mental health. Those two, I think. Um, the housing, job for Inuit, and um, shelter. <laughs> yeah. um, probably housing issues and more school for education. The biggest issue is number one, homelessness, um, mental health, uh, and addressing uh, just uh, helping people to get more access to mental health with the con consistent help. Absolutely. You know, homelessness is always a, a big, big concern. Um, Income support, welfare families, you know, lo looking after, looking after the, the little people, right? You know, there, there's some, a lot of families out there that just need a little bit more help than they're, they're kind of getting now. Um, mental health social, uh, services, social services, uh, child, child and youth services, right? Those, those are things that all need to be improved and, um, yeah, pretty much just Im improved. We'll be talking a lot about those issues this hour. And joining us now all the way in Iqaluit is our reporter, Kent Driscoll. He's been covering news and current affairs in the territory for over 10 years. And sitting in our Ottawa bureau is Jim Bell. He's worked as a journalist in Nunavut for nearly 35 years and has been editor of Nunatsiaq News since 1997, and he now lives in Ottawa. He's been covering every Nunavut election since the creation of the territory. And joining me in studio is Lindsay Kangok. She is an 18-year-old student from Pond Inlet in Nunavut, going to school in Ottawa this year at Nunavut Sibunik Savut. It's an eight-month program for Inuit youth that teaches unique cultural and academic studies aimed to give them skills that will contribute to Nunavut. And also joining us is Helen Navalik Tolokannak. She is originally from Cambridge Bay, Nunavut, and is visiting the city, attending a conference, and has kindly agreed to spend some of her afternoon with us today. So I'd like mm -hmm. to thank all our guests joining us on In Focus this afternoon. Now, I just want to quickly get into the Northwest Territories and Nunavut splitting into two territories. That happened on April 1st, 1999. For some of you who aren't aware, Nunavut means our land in Inuktitut. It's the largest territory in Canada with three time zones. Its land mass is one-fifth of Canada's land mass and it's the least populated region in Canada. So let's start talking with our guests now. Talking about the style of government in Nunavut to give Canada an understanding of what it's like and unlike the rest of Canada with the exception of the NWT it's a consensus style government so Jim I'm going to go to you first of all if you can just give us a brief yet good explanation of the consensus government in Nunavut. Yeah that, that's right I like to use the term nonpartisan government uh, the m candidates uh, do not belong to political parties they don't run under party banners. They run as independents, as individuals. So what will happen on Monday 
in many ways is really 22 separate elections that are happening in the 22 electoral districts, the 22 constituencies simultaneously. And each one of those 22 local elections will, uh, to a large extent, be fought around local issues. Uh, the candidates in each riding will be talking about the things that their communities need, whether it's a, a road or a port or a recreational center. But it's interesting that in, despite the lack of uh, territorial-wide political parties, there's still a lot of common issues. And in those early clips, you heard just about everybody talked about mental health and housing. Uh, another one I would add would be elders care, which is also a very important issue. So dis d despite the, the lack of the, the unifying force that a political party system would create, you still have these common issues that are pretty much the same from one community to another, you know, from Akaluit to Cambridge Bay to Rankin Inlet to Joe Haven, uh, regardless of where you live in Nunavut. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about those issues in the show. Can you briefly explain how the Premier is selected? Well, the Premier is selected probably in mid-November. The newly elected MLAs will gather in Akaluit. Uh, the first thing that they'll do is they'll sit down for about a week for an orientation session, which is most of that will be behind closed doors, where they will be briefed on, uh, it's, they basically take a week long how to be an MLA course. After that is finished, uh, they will open it up to a public forum uh, that they call the Leadership Forum. The first thing that they will do is elect a speaker. Uh, after they finish electing a speaker, the speaker will then chair the rest of the, the gathering. And uh, the, the next thing that they will do after that is choose a premier from among themselves. There will be a call for nominations. Each of the nominated candidates for premier will likely get uh, 10 minutes to speak and they'll open the floor to questions. Uh, they, then they will hold a vote by secret ballot. Uh, when the premier, after the premier is chosen, then they will go ahead and they will choose seven or eight other members from among themselves to serve on the cabinet. And then sometime after that, some days after that, the new premier will assign cabinet portfolios to the new cabinet. So that's basically how it works. In Nunavut elections, the, the public don't directly elect a premier. They don't directly elect a government. The government is chosen by the MLAs after the election uh, from among themselves. And how long is the life of one government? Uh, right now it's four years. The last election, so the last election was held in the fall of 2013. We now have fixed term elections in Nunavut. So the, the next election day in 2021 has already basically been set by legislation and it will be uh, sometime in October of 2021, four years from now. Mm -hmm. So this uh, new assembly that will be elected on Monday, uh, that group uh, will be elected, the fifth le legislative assembly will be elected to serve for a four year term. Right, all right, thank you for that, Jim. Kent, I wanna go to you now. What issues did the last government not finish that this new government will have to take on? Well, one of the big issues, Juanita, that's still standing out is Bill 37. Now, Bill 37 was supposed to amend the Education and Language Acts, and it met with solid opposition from those regular members in the Legislative Assembly. What they were trying to do was move the date where you would have to teach Inuit language in a classroom from kindergarten to grade 12 back. And they wanted to move the date back because the government said that date that was originally set was aspirational, not an actual target that anyone could meet. Now this was met with severe opposition, but if Paul Kwasa is re-elected in Nagloolik and comes back to Iqaluit, he's going to want to readdress that for sure. Uh, another couple of things that are just outstanding, any federal funding or any federal initiative that came in towards the end of the last government before the beginning of this one is going to have to be decided on rapidly. And of course, uh, the marijuana legalization, the new government, that is going to be one of the first things on their plate is how do you regulate and legalize marijuana here in the territory? Mm -hmm. So what would you say the last government accomplished? 
Well, the biggest accomplishment of the last government, and I don't say this as a knock, the biggest accomplishment of the last government was rolling with the punches. Uh, this, the, the previous government, they had two schools burned to the ground by arson, where both of those schools were write-offs, and they had to react quickly to bring education back to the community. Uh, in Panyertong, Panikto, there was a power plant that basically failed overnight, leaving the entire community without power, and they had to get a very heavy-duty helicopter to airlift in a new generator. So if you want to talk about accomplishments of this previous government, being able to roll with some of those very serious punches that they faced, uh, that has to be a feather in their cap. Mm -hmm, for sure. Lindsay, I want to go to you now. I'm curious to know what you hope the next government does for Inuit youth. <clears throat> what I hope to see is getting more youth involvement to the community because there's not much going on and we have nothing else to do but to stay home. So what would you like to see in your communities then? I would like to see elders and youth involvement, regaining our culture, and also getting youth to do something they, that they've never done. Like what? Like our learning our culture and doing the basic stuff, like learning our land claims agreement and mm. Amy. Right. Helen, what are you watching out the most in this coming election? Um, I'm just hoping that uh, we have good leadership and uh, a good legislative assembly and all the members work together and to make Nunavut happier and healthier and to be alive because it's so busy in Nunavut now. So we're hoping that uh, we can see more, more positive stuff and healthier communities. Mm -hmm. And well, you've been in Cambridge Bay when Cambridge Bay was in the Northwest Territories. You're still living in Cambridge Bay where it's now in Nunavut. What would you say that, you know, over the past elections since Nunavut became a territory, what would you say needs the most attention in Cambridge Bay when it comes to the territorial government? Okay. Um, like everyone else, um, housing is a big issue, shortage of housing. And um, in the bigger communities like uh, Iqaluit, Yellowknife, you'll see the homeless, homelessness problem on the rise and we need more housing. That's the big, big issue right now in our community and across Nunavut. And I hope that uh, our next legislative assembly and our leaders will really focus on getting more housing for Inuit in the communities because it's really hurting mm -hmm. the people. Yeah, and I would, I would just add to that in that there's homelessness in almost every community. It's how you see homelessness or how you don't see homelessness. Mm -hmm. In the smaller communities where you don't see homelessness, it's because those who don't have a home are couch surfing mm -hmm. from home to home to home. Yeah. What about jobs in Nunavut? Lindsay, do you have anything to, that you want to add that can relate to jobs in the territory? Uh, what I think is that there is the only job you can get in smaller communities are like cashiers at Northern or Co-op and there's not much experience on let's say the front clerk officer for the hamlet or the health center and when we go to college they expect us to see like we're good at the front clerk, the filing, but we need more of that. More job opportunities to high school students. All right, thank you for that. Well, let's take a quick break now and when we return we'll talk about not all 72 candidates in this coming Nunavut election, but some of them. Stay with us.
Join our conversation now. Send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Like our APTN InFocus Facebook page, follow and tweet us at APTN InFocus, or call in toll free at 1 877 647 2786. Welcome back. Well, the 2016 census shows there are close to 36,000 people living in 25 communities across Nunavut. Only one of those places classifies as a city, Iqaluit, and it's the capital of Nunavut. In Nunavut, there are 22 ridings, 72 candidates this year. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to talk about each of them, but let's chat about some of the candidates right now. So we'll get to some of their promises later. Kent, can you tell us which candidates stand out the most for you? Uh, which candidates stand out the most? Well, mm -hmm. if you're looking for one riding that sort of shows a lot of the difference between what's going on in this election, you could do a lot worse than RV at North Whale Cove. You've got George Cooksook there. Now, George is a longtime uh, MLA. He's held many different positions in cabinet. Well respected, well liked guy. And he's running against John Main. Now, Juanita, you and I know John a little. And John was a CBC reporter here in Iqaluit for years before he moved back to the smaller communities. And he's a younger guy, fluent in a nuketitut, another well-liked, well-known person. So we've got a real race of the, the, uh, the more experienced political class versus the newcomers that really want to change things. And I, I would definitely be keeping an eye on that one on election night. Mm -hmm. Jim? Well, uh, I, in, in some ways, all 22 uh, constituencies are interesting. Uh, there's a, a couple that are interesting to me. One of them is Akalawit Manarayak, where Monica L. Kanayuk is uh, at, at, attempting re-election. Uh, she is facing Ukulik Ayitsiak, who, uh, who has stepped down as international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, and a very bright and interesting young candidate whose name is Adam Ariak. Lightstone. Uh, he is a fiscal advisor in the Department of Finance and he represents a very uh, different kind of young candidate because he has a very good technical and financial education and in his campaign he's been talking, he's been talking about a lot of things but he's also been talking about greater uh, financial accountability and, and transparency in the government. So th that's one uh, and also Jude Lewis is also running there. He's a, he's a first timer who has lived in Iqaluit for a while. So that, that's a very interesting co uh, constituency for me. Uh, another one is Ivy League, uh, where you have two former cabinet ministers run and well-known uh, Nunavut po politicians running against each other. Jack Anawak, who's a former minister of justice from the first Nunavut government that was elected in 1999 is running against Patek Netzer, who is a former economic development minister and minister of the environment. Uh, th th that could be an interesting result there. Uh, there, are other, there are, but there are a lot of others that I can talk about. Karen Kabluna against uh, Simeon Mikingwak in, in Baker Lake. Uh, there, there are two really interesting people there, and uh, there are nine candidates running in Kotiktuk, the High Arctic riding. Uh, w one of them is the, 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 the famous elder Isaac Suyuk, and uh, eight other people running against him. So in that constituency, if the vote splits the right way, you could win that seat with 12 or 13 percent of the vote. And I want to bring up the um, the Kutituk riding. There are nine candidates running in that one, the most out of any mm -hmm. others. I'm just wondering from either Jim or Kent, your reaction to that one. Well, there are a lot of people seem to want that oh. job. But one, one of the other interesting candidates there is David Akiro, who is a former deputy <coughs> minister of executive and intergovernmental affairs. That's the top. Uh, non-elected bureaucratic position within 
the government of Nunavut. Uh, he's originally from Greece Fjord, uh, so the, 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 that writing includes his home community. Uh, he would have to be considered a front run runner. Uh, there's also uh, Rachel Kitzwalik, who's a former columnist with Nunatsiak News, is running there, and, and quite a few other people. Um, I don't know why that constituency has attracted so many candidates. Uh, it's it, it's pot, perhaps there's some dissatisfaction there, or perhaps it's just a year when a large number of people from those communities uh, want want another job or want to uh, get out there and produce some kind of a change. Well, going back to the 2013... And one thing that uh, Jim and I have both... Go ahead. No, you go ahead, Kent. Sorry about that. No, just one, thing, ahead, that Jim and I, one thing that Jim and I both touched on there with our descriptions is what I've been seeing a lot of in this election are territorial civil servants opting to throw their hat in the ring politically. Uh, he mentioned David Akiakuk up in uh, the High Arctic riding. Uh, Karen Kabluna out in Baker Lake. Uh, we have the assistant to the clerk of the Legislative Assembly, Cindy Rennie, running here in Iqaluit. These are people who know how the actual levers of power work. You're taking people who have a hands-on knowledge of the government in Nunavut, and they're trying to get their hands on the political oper uh, operation of the government in Nunavut. And that is a really interesting trend in this election. Mm -hmm. and I was going to mention that um, looking back at that writing in the 2013 election, there was only two candidates running in that writing and this year there are nine. Um, let's move over to Lindsay again. I'm curious to know about what you think about your writing in, in Pond Inlet. It's called Tununak. Tunu Tunu um, what can you tell us about uh, the candidates running in your writing? Uh, there is three, three people running for Tununak and I've talked to the three of them separately asking two questions on what's import uh, what's their first priority and how long what what their background is with the po politics and it's very interesting to see to hear what they think of what their priority is do you want to talk about those ones uh, <coughs> there is Jeannie Mills uh, she was with home care and she's been living in Pond Inlet for several years now and her first priority is pu public health and she wants to address that and there's David Kamanek who who is very interested in bringing the youth and elders involvement to the community and the getting soup kitchen for our community, youth centers and swimming pool. Joe Inup wants to continue doing what he's doing and giving his be best ability. That's pretty amazing that you actually reached out to the candidates and asked them for yeah. their input as to what their issues are in this coming election. Yes, um, I want to become an Inuit politician when I grow up and these kind of things interest me and I always want to be on top with what's going on in my community. Wow, and a perfect guest for us today to provide the youth's perspective on the, the upcoming elections. Um, Helen, I'm curious to know from you about uh, the current MLA, Keith Peterson. He's in your community of uh, Cambridge Bay and he's not running again this year. What are your thoughts? Um, I haven't really spoke with him because he's always traveling and always working in Iqaluit and going to meetings. But I seen him the other day and uh, he's He's had his time with, you know, politics and the Legislative Assembly. I don't know what his plans are, but uh, we have this, this election, we have three Inuit running, which is really exciting. We have two women, two Inuit women, and one, one male candidate. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to the elections and 
for having our new MLA because Cambridge Bay is so busy with the uh, the new Canadian High Arctic Research Station that's uh, just finish finishing up its uh, construction and uh, we're going to have a grand opening soon so that's going to be busy for our youth which is exciting time in Cambridge Bay especially for our youth. Yeah, I was noticing that, yeah. and it's a beautiful building too. It is. So you'll have to come up and and the film crew. And 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 yeah, <laughs> I go and check it come out. Come to for the sure. grand opening. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jim, I want to go back to you for a second um, and talk about the outgoing premier, uh, Peter Taptuna. Can you talk about maybe some of the accomplishments that he's made during his time in office? Well, when Peter Taptuna became Premier in 2013, uh, he, he, when, he was, when he was campaigning before the MLAs for it, uh, he, he kept, he, he kept his, his pitch very simple. And he really talked about two priorities. One was education and the other was economic development. And in education, uh, he promised that social promotion the practice of promoting children from one grade to the next, uh, whether or not they've mastered the material or not. He said that social promotion would come to an end and that they were going to engage in a major retrofit of the school system in Nunavut. The other is that he was going to bring a renewed focus to economic development and especially resource development uh, because of the, the job creating power of, of big mining projects and, and so on. And on the, so on the economic development front, he's probably uh, done as, as good a job as can be expected, although uh, with, with two exceptions. One, Nunavut still does not have a devolution agreement uh, to transfer uh, power over uh, over public lands and uh, public lands and resources. Unlike provinces, the Nunavut territory does not control uh, mi mineral exploration and the, cannot get royalties from mining on pu on public lands. Uh, so that never happened, even though he was quite optimistic during his term as Premier that there would be a devolution agreement by the fall of 2017. That just never happened. Uh, and also, uh, it's been pretty slow going and a lot of the big infrastructure projects that are supposed to trigger more mining development, particularly the Grays Bay project which he has pushed personally. This would be a, a roughly 650 kilometer road from the abandoned Jericho diamond mine site to Coronation Gulf on, on the Arctic Ocean. It's a big, big issue for the Katikmiut region, if for people who live in Kugluktuk and Cambridge Bay. And the hope is that this would trigger the development of the huge zinc deposit, lead zinc deposit at Isaac Lake and uh, a, a, another one further inland. Uh, this project, however, is just starting to get going. They're doing preliminary research work and it's just entered the, uh, re the regulatory process. So that's a long way from, uh, from happening. And the other is the Nunavut Manitoba Road, which uh, Taptuna's government talked about a lot and previous governments also talked about a lot. Not much is really happening on that front. They're still at the research stage, but there have been no commitments from either Manitoba or the federal government to finance it. So in economic development, uh, he's had su some successes and he, s he certainly put a lot of energy into pushing those files, but uh, it's sort of a mixed result. And on education, it's, it's a mixed result as well because Bill 37, their attempt to amend the Education Act uh, it, it, it fizzled when the regular MLAs refused to d debate it in the House when, when they had a chance to. So, uh, the, the, so I, I think it would, for him, it's, it's probably a mixed result, some disappointments and some successes. Any idea why he's not running again? 
Uh, I, I, I don't know why. Only, only uh, Mr. Taptuna can, can answer that question. Uh, when, uh, he, when he made the decision not to run, he didn't really say why. I suspect that it was probably for family reasons, although he has said that he wants, he wants to continue his involvement in politics in other roles, uh, perhaps as president of Katikmute Inuit Association after that uh, position comes up, uh, I think it's a year or two from now, or perhaps in, in, in some other role. Uh, but uh, he hasn't specifically stated why he d does not want to run as a, as, as, a, as a member of the Legislative Assembly again. Uh, and uh, I, I, I can't read his mind. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he said what he said, I think, last week at the Katikmut Inuit Association. He made a, a statement sort of summing up his, his, his time in office, mm -hmm. and it, it appears primarily to be for personal reasons. Okay. But he still wants to stay involved in politics. Okay. I want to get to uh, a caller yeah. that we have on the line. We have uh, Kaumareq from Iqaluit is on the line. Hello, Kaumareq. Hi there. How are you guys doing? We're good, thanks. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. I was just told to give you guys a phone call, talk about the elections, and talk about um, the situation that's happening up in Nunavut. Okay. What would you like to share? Um, first of all, um, like with our new MLA candidates, most of them doesn't want to talk about um, job opportunities. Like most of the jobs up here, that is, uh, um, I'm fighting for land claim agreements. I have a Facebook page too called Shame on Canada, and it's based about what's happening about in Nunavut. Um, talking about jobs, training, housing. Uh, with the TV crisis that's going on up here, because most of the homes are filled up and they're always overcrowded. But with my petition, I'm trying to make those homes less crowded by giving them subsidized staff housing like non inuit has been getting. But uh, most of the time, um, uh, the companies that is operating in Nunavut, they doesn't want to give Inuit those kind of job opportunities. Even most of the jobs with, uh, with disabilities like taxi drivers, hotel workers, dispatch they just keep calling up a southerner and southerner and um but i was just wondering why our mla candidates doesn't want to talk about those kind of issues when it's a very big factor and it's been going on and on up here justin trudeau saw my petition in february but he hasn't talked about it or nothing has really been changing going on up here yet and um with the housing situation i think it's pretty it's a shame because we got only 30,000 Inuits and two governments and the feds can't help us out with that situation. And um, things need to be addressed and a lot more brought to attention, especially with the jobs up here. Because like um, everywhere you look, we've got no jobs. It's just really disrespectful how our current, uh, our current MLAs and uh, big government workers doesn't want to talk about those kind of issues, including when there's a lot of shack fires, including death. And uh, yet, like Adam has said on CBC, he said not even one MLA talked about the fires that's happening in the, sh in the beaches and the shacks up here. And there's a lot of elders, families, babies living like that, and they're always running around cold. And we could at least give them at least the right jobs and training. I think it will be a lot more step ahead for their, our future that is coming up. All right. Thank you so much for the phone call, Kaumarek. Certainly some issues to to think about and process, so thanks again. All right, thank you. Okay. Now, let's just take a quick break. Uh, we have more to talk about, and when we return, we'll talk about some of the issues that the candidates are raising that they feel are important for Nunavut, and of course, we'll get our panel's input on some of those issues, so stay with us. Welcome back. Well, one of the big questions after who's running is, are you going to vote? Kent went out on the streets of Iqaluit and asked that very question. Here's what some Nunavumut had to say. Uh, do you plan on voting on October 30th and why? 
I absolutely do, and I've actually gone to the advanced school, so, and I'm in the uh, Happy Valley area. So you voted already? Yes, I did. What would you say to other people who haven't voted yet? I would say get out there and vote, and I know that people who think that voting doesn't make a difference, it absolutely does. So I would say get out there and vote. I do plan on uh, voting on the public radio because I believe in not wasting my vote. I mean, it might only be one, but it's mine and it's my shot. Do you plan on going to vote at the end oh, of the Oh, yes. Day? And why are you going to go vote? Because um, we need more help. It's my chance to vote. I'll vote. I wish everybody would vote. And why? Because it counts, man. We have to do something for the future. Look at the future and work forward. Um, I don't think I'm going to vote for anybody. Why not? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna vote, but I haven't made up my mind yet. <laughs> Very important question. And Lindsay, you actually had a reaction to the young woman who said she wasn't going to go out and vote. Why is that? Uh, I was very excited to vote because I just turned 18, and like you, you think that every uh, you think your vote doesn't count, but it actually does. Your vote counts, and your voice matters. Mm -hmm. And you just uh, you just mentioned as well that you've already casted your vote for this election. Yes, uh, we voted in Nunavut Sibunik Sabut. There was a mail ballot, and we all had our votes. What was it like for you to make your your vote count? I felt like I was an adult. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, it was my first great. time. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about living in Pond Inlet? <clears throat> living in Pond Inlet is, you know everyone and everyone knows you. Everyone is welcoming. And although there's some problems going on like the food security and no jobs, but <clears throat> you enjoy what you have with everyone. Mm. Mm. What would you like to see the Nunavut government do for your community? Main thing is the mental health. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on around Pond and Lit and like there's no permanent job for mental health and as a youth, especially as a youth, there is no one to turn to. When, you, when you're going for mental health, talking to a mental health, and then like six weeks later, another mental health comes in and you'll have to open up again for another six weeks. And that's not normal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of the issues um, in addition to what Lindsay just mentioned, mental health. Helen, can you talk about some of the issues that you would like to see addressed for your community or for Nunavut as a whole? Well, I was attending the Qatarmiyut Inuit Association, AGM, and I listened to some concerns and issues and uh, what families would like to see in the smaller communities is to have elders facilities so that their family and loved ones don't have to get sent away like to uh, like I believe in the bath and they're sending them to Ottawa and uh, it makes it really hard on families and also for the elders. Well let's and put that into perspective quickly just so that people get an understanding so for example elders that live in the bath and region if they need long-term care they are sent to Ottawa. a facility in Ottawa they're away from their family, they're away from their culture, their language, their yeah. food. Mm -hmm. And so this is being raised in your community, this issue. Um, in our area, also in the smaller communities like Tel Oryok, Kougariuk, Ochoktok, and Kongloktok, they'd like to see facilities for their elders mm -hmm. so the families can stay closer to home. And mm -hmm. 
And Jim, I know you've mentioned it before as well, just about the elders care issue that's, uh, that's sort of plagued the Nunavut Territory. Did you, any, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I was going to say that the level of care that is needed the most is what bureaucrats call level five care. That's the form of care that's offered at the Embassy West Center in Ottawa. And it is for elders who require almost constant uh, at at attention. Elders with serious conditions like Alzheimer's uh, or elders with serious physical conditions. There are no facilities in Nunavut that are able to offer that level of care. And increasing numbers of elders have been sent at great expense to uh, facilities like Embassy West in Ottawa where it's costing up to 160000 per year per elder to keep uh, to, to give them care at, at, at these centers. I believe that uh, some are also sent to Churchill and Edmonton. Uh, there are, there is some elder care in Nunavut, but, it, but the, the level of care is at a lower level. Uh, there's an elders uh, residential facility, a small one in Akaluit, there's another one in Rankin Inlet. Uh, and there uh, are uh, facilities in other communities that are able to offer lower levels of care to smaller numbers of elders. But the problem is that the generation of people who were born between about 1946 and 1964, the baby boom generation, those people are now entering their final years. And so you have this really big group, this really big cohort of people who are starting to get older and starting to require elder care. And people are looking at this and saying, we need more elder centers because uh, it, it's too hard on the families and it's too hard on the elders to have to send them all the way to, to, to Ottawa. And if you look at the kind of money that they're spending on it, uh, it, 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 it's not hard to see how there's a strong argument that could be made for spending that money in Nunavut by, by building centers like the one that's proposed for Kugluktuk. There's also another one that has been a big one that has been proposed for a, a Kalawit by a group called the Silevik Society. Mm -hmm. Kent, I want to get to you um, because obviously as our reporter in, in Nunavut, what are some of the issues that you're hearing a lot about from either the Legislative Assembly or from constituents or from, from Nunavut as a whole? Well, Juanita, this is not going to be a surprise to you. You and I both know this. On some level, every Nunavut story comes down to housing. The housing crisis in the territory, combined with the fact that we have Canada's youngest and fastest growing population, it's just a ticking time bomb. I mean, you can look at every single issue. Education, well, if you live in an overcrowded home, it's really hard to get to sleep on time to do, or do your homework. You're overcrowded. Uh, if you have too many people in your home, it's hard to keep groceries in the home. If you're looking at uh, the cost of living, if you're looking at so, and so much of Nunavut's budget comes from federal sources. So like Jim was mentioning earlier with devolution, if, we can get, if Nunavut can get a handle on both devolution and housing, all of the other, ish, all of the other areas are going to improve somewhat. So everything ties to housing here. All right. Well, we're almost out of time, but I do want to get some final thoughts on the show before then. Lindsay, I'm going to ask you just to say your pitch to the youth out there to go out and vote. What's something you can tell them? <clears throat> go out and vote. Vote for who you want to see. Um, just vote. Just go out and vote, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Helen, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share? No, I, I just want to say good luck to all the candidates and that uh, those that are elected, don't make too many promises, but work on the issues that are in your communities and work with the people mm -hmm. and communicate. Jim, I just wanted to ask you quickly as well, just to talk about uh, some of the issues that you're hearing from some of the candidates that you can provide in your, your final thoughts. Well, apart from lo local issues, uh, it, it's, it's the issues that, uh, that, uh, that others have, have mentioned already. 
housing, housing, housing. It's a perennial issue. It's, it's also linked closely to uh, mental health and physical health, especially tuberculosis and other communicable diseases. Uh, mental health on, it, on its own. There's tremendous demand in the communities for more counselors, more professional help for people who are suffering from various forms of mental distress. And elder care is a big one. And also, as Kent mentioned, a cannabis policy. Uh, I think that's, uh, as Kent, I think, said on Twitter, th that is a really big sleeper issue. And the government of Nunavut will, ha will have some really big social policy decisions to make before July 1st, 2018, when cannabis becomes legal, such as the minimum age for cannabis consumption. Mm -hmm. Should it be 18 years, 21? 25, the, the Nunavut government can, can, set, uh, can set that. And also, how will cannabis be distributed in Nunavut? Will there be shops where you can buy cannabis? Will private sector uh, uh, businesses be licensed to sell cannabis? Will the government sell it? Will there be a mail order system? Uh, what about the regulate, can you, will you be able to use cannabis in a public place or will that, will that be prohibited? There's lots of decisions that the government will have to make before July 1st, and they don't have a lot of time to make those decisions in. And because it's Nunavut, they have to consult the population before, um, be, before making final decisions. So uh, th that's, that's going to be an important issue, I think. So Jim, anything that you're gonna be watching for come Monday? Uh, I, I, I am hesitant to, I don't like predicting the future because in Nunavut, uh, you're often wrong. Uh, I, I think that the best we can hope for is a good turnout uh, and a, uh, a, 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 a good, uh, well-prepared set of new MLAs. Uh, I hope we see a serious group of people uh, elected on Monday who will uh, make good choices when they elect a premier and a, and a cabinet. All right. Kent, I want to ask you the same question. Just with anything that you're watching out for come Monday. Well, I'm going to be cautious like Jim because anyone who tells you that they have any polling data on Nunavut is straight out lying to you. These, the, and one of the best parts of these elections are how unpredictable they are. You can have someone in a small community and us here in Iqaluit wouldn't even necessarily hear about the groundswell of support they have until we look up on election night and go, wow, who is that? So I'm excited for Monday. It's always an interesting time for those of us who pay too much attention to politics here in the territory. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to be on Monday? Uh, me? Yes, you. <laughs> I am, uh, I'm going to be down in Ottawa by Monday, but I will be watching remotely and I cast my ballot before I left. Right on. Jim, yourself, where are you going to be on Monday? Uh, I will be here in Ottawa. Uh, our managing editor, editor Lisa Gregoire, is traveling to Iqaluit tomorrow. She will be in Iqaluit on Election Day along with our two reporters there. And, and I think Kent put it really well. I'm going to be looking out for the surprises because there are always surprises in Nunavut. Mm -hmm. Helen, where are you going to be on Monday? I'm going to be at home sweet home in beautiful Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. Are you going weather to vote? permitting. Always <laughs> weather permitting. Are you going to go out and vote on Monday? Oh, yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Lindsay, your class at Nunavut Suvenik Savut, it's a, it's a class made up of uh, Inuit students from across the territory. Do you guys mm -hmm. have any plans come Monday how you're going to watch the elections, or is it just a normal school day as scheduled? For myself, I'm going to watch. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be away at Harris Farm. And I'm going to make sure to watch. All right. Well, you know what? There's an awesome website that is out there put, uh, put together by the folks over at Nunavut Elections that uh, answers almost every question that you might have when it comes to where you need to go and vote, who's running, things like that. And to find that information, here is some on where you can receive it. The website, elections.nu.ca. The office is based in Rankin Inlet in Nunavut, and the phone number there is area code 867-645-4610. Toll-free number, 
1-800-242-4394. And uh, there you see the fax and email address as well, info at elections.nu.ca. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank my guests, Jim Bell, Kent Driscoll, Lindsay Kangluk, and Helen Napalik Tolorana. Thank you all so much for joining me this afternoon. Voting day for Nunavut elections is on Monday, October the 30th. And like I said, if you're looking for more information, check out the website. I'm Juanita Tautungi. Have a wonderful afternoon.